Welcome to the worship of God here at First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. First Church is an open, welcoming, and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, which means this. You are welcome here. You are safe to sing or laugh or shed a tear. We love you just the way you are, so have no fear. You are welcome here if you are happy or sad, old or young, confused or inspired, full of faith or full of doubt, poetic or pragmatic, or a combination of all these things. You are welcome in our community no matter your religion, your ethnicity, who you love, where you grew up, how much money you have, or the color of your skin. For here we proclaim that each person is valuable, loved, and essential. Here we try to be a place of grace and peace where all God's children have a home. And in this home, our church leaders have prayerfully and carefully led this congregation throughout the pandemic, always being mindful of the health and well-being of all of our members. And as of today, our plan is to resume in-person worship this coming Sunday, February 6th. Throughout the month of February, we will have one service at 10 a.m., and of course that service will be live-streamed. We will continue to ask everyone to sign up for the worship services and follow our COVID protocols. Here at First Church, as we all know, there are so many ways to be engaged and so many opportunities for mission and outreach, for learning and fellowship, and for worship and discipleship. Now to set the context for today's service, if I were to say Western Boulevard here in Glastonbury, what immediately comes to your mind? Healthcare, possibly? Doctors offices, clinics, urgent care centers, healthcare specialists of nearly every kind. We are truly blessed on this eastern side of the Connecticut River to have such outstanding health care just a hop, skip, and a jump away. But now if I were to say Main Street in Glastonbury, what comes to mind? I imagine it might be commercial establishments like Panera, Bertucci's, Daybreak, McDonald's, or even the town offices, the police station, Wells Turner Library. Well, today I would like to take us back to the topic of health care, the caring for our hearts, minds, bodies, souls, and suggest that Ma Main Street should also bring to mind Saints Isidore and Maria Roman Catholic Church, St. James Episcopal Church, and yes, First Church. So David, are you trying to say that the church has something to do with health care? Well, I think I mentioned a few years ago that my roommate at Yale Divinity School, Scott, since being a boy growing up in Georgia, wanted to be both a doctor and a Methodist minister. Well, decades later, the Church Health Center of Memphis, started by Scott, is the largest church-based health clinic in our nation. Last year, they served over 61,000 appointments for the working poor using over 700 volunteer doctors. Scott has said this, healing must not be relegated solely to, to the physicians and the healthcare system. Instead, the faith community must make healing a central issue in all matters of hope, care, and compassion. It was about 20 years ago that Scott asked me to submit a sermon for a collection uh, in a book that he was publishing called, I Am the Lord Who Heals You. I gave him a sermon and I preached it from this pulpit in November of 2003. Well, today I've updated that sermon and it once again makes the case that even at the time of death, when healing seems no longer possible, churches on Main Street, USA, like First Church, still have a powerful, powerful role in providing people a word of hope, a word of compassion, and a word of healing love. Let us now join together in our call to worship.
Friends, if you are tired, come and worship with us in this holy space and time. If you are filled with joy, come and worship. If you are hurting, come and worship. If your spirit needs renewing, come and worship. Here we find a song for our souls and healing for our wounds. There is healing when we come before our God. Here there are words that heal brokenness and reveal God's grace. Now let us join together in our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Great and wonderful healer, make us aware of your powerful spirit during this time of worship. Like so many that Jesus touched, we are all in need of healing. Touch our brokenness and lift us out of despair and doubt. Dry our tears of pain and sorrow comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your great love, O loving God, that we might faithfully trust in your healing power. May this beloved community forever be the warmth and compassion of your love and grace. We pray this in the name of the great physician who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello. Come on. Everybody come on over. Sit down. Join Miss Lauren and Mrs. Bear. Oh, look, can you see Mrs. Bear? <laughs> She's got a new outfit. Ooh. Wardrobe change. <laughs> thank you. We all can we all say thank you to Miss Norma Vaughn who designed this custom piece for her exact measurement. It's awesome. Mrs. Bear, you look wonderful. Mwah. Okay, I have a question for you guys. So I need you to put on those thinking caps. Boing. Boing. Okay. Who, who takes care of you? Yeah. Maybe mom. Mm -hmm. Or dad. Or maybe both moms. Maybe you have two moms. Or two dads. Yes, they are so awesome. 
grandparents, friends, step parents, aunts and uncles. Maybe you have a pet at home. Do you have a dog or a cat or a fish? Yes. Yes, they all take care of us. Good. Okay. And how, this is going to be a tricky one, how do they take care of you? If you're, especially if you're having like maybe a, a rough day or a sad day, what do they do for you? Yeah, you can shout it out. Go ahead, nice and loud. Mrs. Bear's got to hear it. Uh-huh. Yes. They might cook for you. They might snuggle you, feed you. Mm, what? Maybe give you a bath, protect you, put a roof over your head, tell you that you're doing a good job. Absolutely. Okay, so this Sunday, Pastor David was talking a little bit about in the intro that it's Health and Human Service Sunday. Oh my goodness, what is that? Well, health, right? That's taking care of our mind and our body and our soul. And human service is being in service or helping other humans. All right, yeah, okay, and bears, okay, and bears. And the way that we can do that is, do you know there are people in this world that help other people, like, all the time? Maybe you've heard the term essential worker lately. Okay, come on, shout it out now. Who, what kind of people are essential workers? Yeah, beside bears. We got it. Okay, shout it out. Let me hear it. Uh-huh. Yes. Doctors, nurses, mm-hmm. Grocery store workers, yes. Delivery professionals. I know the Amazon delivery person has been at my house several times, right? Yeah, we order lots of stuff, mainly donuts. And how about maybe our pastors, right? They have been there to comfort us and heal us and take care of us. It's so important to take care of others, but it's also important to take care of ourselves first. And you can take care of yourself by eating your fruits and veggies. Yes, Mrs. Bear says so, even though she loves donuts. Getting enough sleep, doing the right thing, taking a bath. Then you can take care of others. And there's so many ways you can take care of others. You can make a card, you can FaceTime grandparents, you can, hmm, let's see, Mrs. Bear, what else could they do? Yes. They could come to Mission Immersion Day on February 12th, right here, and join you and I, make some cookies. Usually we eat a few. Okay, no, just one. Shh. And then we deliver them to people who need them. There is a lot of need out in that world. And whether it's you or someone you love, God loves us all. All right? Wonderful. Okay. Come on now, stand up. Look at your adults and say with me, may the good news of God's love be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pass the peace.
Let us join our hearts and minds in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Tender God, your spirit stirred over the waters and created light and life. We come to this time of worship with hearts and hands and voices yearning for your presence. Holy One, as we sit in quietness, our thoughts are far from quiet. We are wrestling with doubts and fears. We are searching for answers. We are seeking strength and hope. We are so hungry for warm sunshine, for healed bodies, for rest from tears, for inclusive behaviors, rather than excluding one another. We look to you, O oh God, as our constant companion who is always there to guide us, inspire us, and restore us. But sometimes everything seems heavy, and so we turn to you, and we turn to prayer. And now, in this moment, we pray for those whom we love so much. As one gathered body, we share the names of people on our hearts and minds, either out loud or in the quiet of this moment. God, our healer, we know you've heard all of our prayers, the one said out loud and the one said silently. And we know that you are a tender and loving God, and we give thanks that you created us in your image, each of us with gifts, every person with worth and value. And God, may we always remember to treat each person we meet with love and respect. But Holy One, we look out into the world and we know we need more hope, more compassion, and more vision. People are dying, people are scared, people are homeless and hungry and sad. People are being violated, put down and left behind. We know, O oh healer God, that we may not be able to fix all the challenges of the world, but we know we can't be silent and we can't always be still. Each one of us inspired by you, God, and by your Son, Jesus, to be faithful, to speak up, to act. Loving God, there are moments when life is overwhelming and isolating. And yet we know our faith calls us to hope and to a community that loves. So this is what we strive to do each and every day in each and every word we speak and action we take. God, be with us, challenge us, inspire us always to be your faithful people. We pray all this in the name of Jesus who teaches us to live and to love. Amen. That sermon that is in Scott's book is titled, When the Phone Rings, When the Phone Rings. But in updating, updating this 20-year-old sermon for today, I easily could have changed it to when the text comes. It was just last week that Kate and I received a text from Cindy Bates, which shared the sad news that her father Gordon Bates, for 10 years our minister of visitation, had died. That the church has a critical role to play in the moral, spiritual, and physical well-being of its members is indisputable. This is in part demonstrated by the healing ministry of Jesus himself. 
I think as we all know, the stories of Jesus' miraculous healing are too many to recount here. Healing the leper, the blind, the mute, the demon-possessed, and the paralyzed. Healing of heart, mind, body, and soul must be central to the life and ministry of the church if we are to be true to Jesus' life and ministry. But what if healing is no longer possible? What then? When all the therapies of our truly wonderful modern medicine have been tried and death is all but inevitable, what then is the church's role? Does the church have a role in helping people heal from the pain of the death of a loved one? And what is the role of the church when that text comes in or when the phone rings? Let us listen now to the word from God. From 1 Kings. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Since then, she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even when the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. And now a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Soon afterwards, he went to a town, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As Jesus approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. May God bless our understanding of these readings.
Hello, David. This is Dan. We need your help. We need to have a memorial service for our daughter, Sarah. She died last night. Sarah Jean was 23 months old, and she died in her father's arms. David, our church secretary, said to me, that call was from Mark, Mary Lou, has died. Mary Lou was 51, 
the church moderator, former senior deacon. Her two-year struggle with cancer was over. And in the midst of a church's festive holiday fair and cookie walk, the voicemail message was retrieved. Hello, this is Donna. My son Eric was one of the three boys killed last night in the accident. Three high school seniors and a father of two children perished in a fiery automobile crash just as the Advent season of hope, peace, joy, and love had begun. When the phone rings, wouldn't it be nice if the church possessed that healing power of Elijah? Give me your son, Elijah said to the grieving widow. Her son's illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Elijah then implored God, O oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. Nestled in her father's loving arms, why couldn't Sarah Jean's life come into her again? When the phone rings, wouldn't it be nice if the church possessed Elijah's resurrection authority? Elijah picked up the child, brought him down from the upstairs chamber, and gave him to his mother, saying, See, your son is alive. My Lord and my God, why couldn't someone pick up 17-year-old Eric and give him over to his mother, saying, See, your son is alive. When the phone rings, wouldn't it be nice if we somehow were able to say to someone like Mark, husband of Mary Lou, as Jesus said to the widow in Nain, do not weep, God has looked favorably upon his people. When the phone rings, what can we say to someone who has lost a baby girl? What can we say to someone who has lost a teenage son? What can we say to someone who's lost a beloved wife? What can our faith possibly say at times such as these? What can the church say at times such as these? What possible healing power is available to the church at these moments of death and finality? When there is no prophet Elijah, no miracle working Jesus, no apparent power to raise the dead to new life. Friends, what is left? What ministry of healing remains for the church? The phone also rang for me one summer when I was just out of college, working in a downtown Hartford church. It was a Friday afternoon and I was preparing to take a van of youth and young adults to a summer concert at Tangwood featuring Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor. The church secretary said the call was for me from the pastor of my home church in Worcester, Massachusetts. David, your father had a heart attack while playing tennis and he's now unconscious. I drove the one hour home. In the emergency room at the hospital, my father had gone into cardiac arrest but they were able to breathe life back into him. Nine weeks later, however, he died, never regaining consciousness. What was the church's ministry to me during those nine weeks? My memory of the church's healing love is as visit, vivid as it happened right after today's first cup of coffee. At that church where I was working, Lay and clergy dropped everything to take over my duties. And over those many weeks of our vigil at my father's bedside, the telephone calls of compassion and concern seemed to find me wherever I was. Their prayers and worship touched my heart. Their presence at the memorial service will never ever be forgotten. In the loss and the tragedy that I was experiencing, the church had a powerful word of healing to be spoken. Just as the woman said to Elijah, 
The word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The church had a word of truth to speak to me at that moment. You see, when the phone, ring, when the phone rings, the church has a word to speak and a truth to tell. And that truth and that word is love. But can the word really be heard at those saddest times for families who, who have lost loved ones? The funeral service for little Sarah Jean was a celebration of love and a celebration of life. As we sit and sat and listened to her favorite music from The Lion King, we were reminded of the circle of life of which we all are privileged for a while to be a part. Two years later, when family, friends, and the community gathered to dedicate a playground in Sarah Jean's memory, I offered the following words in prayer. And so, God, we now dedicate this playground as a place to share life. We rejoice and we give thanks for the joyous experience of life that will happen here. We give thanks for playing and jumping and climbing, for skipping, swinging and sliding, for riding, running and bouncing. We give thanks for the laughter and the giggles, the gleeful and happy sounds of children, for the simple enjoyment of this playground, this playground of life, this playground of love. Gracious God, we give you thanks that Sarah's life and love are very much alive and will remain with us forever in your unbroken circle of life. And Mary Lou will be remembered forever at the church she loved and served and at the high school where she taught, coached, and earned the respect of students, teachers, parents, to the 500 people in attendance at that northern New England meeting house and to the overflow crowd in the church's social hall. I shared the experience that I had with Mark and Mary Lou just a few days before her death. During that visit to their home that they had built together with their own hands, we shared in a time of prayer, scripture reading, and the sacrament of Holy Communion. After reading a psalm or two that I had chosen, they asked me to read Psalm 19, a psalm that had offered them great strength, great comfort, and great hope. And so as we gathered close around her bedside holding hands, I read these words from her Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. For you, O Lord, are my rock and my redeemer. A loving God and Jesus, the rock and the redeemer, was the word for Mary Lou's life. It was the truth for her life. It was the good news that the church proclaimed to her and her family, and it was the good news that they proclaimed to us. It was the good news that sustained her, even in the midst of the sadness and tragedy of her death. But what about the tragedy of death during the Advent and Christmas season of three high school youth and a father of two young children? That Friday night collision left the families, the high school, this entire community with many unanswered questions. What can our faith possibly say at times such as these? What healing power is left to the church at these moments of death and finality. When there is no prophet Elijah, 
no miracle working Jesus, no apparent power or authority to raise the dead to life from the wreckage on the streets. What then is left? When the phone rings, what word of hope and love can possibly be spoken? What is the church's healing ministry at times such as these? Oh, this southern New England meeting house was also filled to capacity and overflowing into the social hall. The sea of 300 youthful high school faces dominated the congregation. This would be the first of three funeral services for them on this cold December day. Area television cameras would capture their somber march down Main Street to attend the other two services. Printed on the cover for Eric's funeral service was a single candle in the scripture verse that Eric had chosen to read the year before at the confirmation ceremony of candle lighting and the reaffirmation of baptismal vows. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and will never walk in darkness. That morning we gave thanks for Eric's 17 wonderful years. We gave thanks for the incredible gift of Eric's life. And we gave thanks for the awesome gift of the life of Jesus Christ, whose light has made it so we will never walk in darkness ever again. You see, in times of sadness, tragedy, and loss, the church can be that light that pierces the darkness. When that phone rings and when it seems as if the darkness has overcome all the life in the world, the church has a life, Jesus' life, to share. When the phone rings, the church has a light to share. When the phone rings, the church has a love to share. Friends, the church will always be ready with love when the phone rings. Please join us in our closing hymn, Jesus, Thy Boundless Love to Me.
join me in the commissioning. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, to be of good courage, to hold fast to that which is good, to render to no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the afflicted, to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. During this seemingly endless pandemic, there's been lots of speculation about what this shutdown might mean for the future of the church, with people perhaps getting out of the habit of going to church. Well, frankly, I'm not worried. In just this past week, as this service about the power of a church's love came together, two things reaffirmed my optimism. Let me see if I can capture them for you. I knew a little bit about Andre Leon Talley before his death last week, but like you, I learned a whole lot more as I read and watched television reports. Brought up by his grandmother, who was a maid at Duke University, she embodied both faith fashion and faith in her life, always dressing stylishly for church, of course, particularly at Easter. But as Andre Leon Talley made his white way in life as an American fashion journalist, creative director and editor at large at Vogue magazine, life wasn't always easy for him. He was successful, of course, in the life he chose. But as a boy, he was bullied and beaten and as he journeyed, it was clear that he was, he was different, a loner, often an outsider. But it was the love and faith of his mother and of his church that sustained him and gave him strength. Listen to what he had to say about his grandmother and about his church. I know what it is like to be brought up with unconditional love. In my life, that came from my grandmother. And my grandmother taught me that you cannot forget going to church. Every day you go to church, that impresses me. It gives you strength. Darling, clothes are not important in this pandemic. What's important is your strength that comes from your faith, your values. All of that is very ingrained in you, so therefore you can survive. And the other piece that came to me this week was hearing what our choir would be singing for this service, Jesus Christ, the apple tree. Hmm, what does that mean, Jesus Christ, the apple tree? Well, each year the Senior High Youth Fellowship kicks off their program with a rally picnic outing at the home of Vin and Catherine Ladone, and their home is surrounded by apple trees. Then later in the fall, one of the fellowship activities is picking those apples, which are then given away only a few days later at Mobile Food Share in our church's parking lot. Today the, today the choir sang, For happiness I long have sought, and pleasure dearly I have bought. I missed of all, but now I see, tis found in Christ the apple tree. Friends, I believe the church is called to be the embodiment of Jesus Christ, the apple tree. And in the church, we can truly say that we find the happiness, the pleasure, and the healing love that we all yearn for. Amen. Amen. 